Okay, class. We're going to discuss atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. Now, cardiovascular disease can entail uh, disease or dysfunction to any component of the cardiovascular system. So this could include the myocardium as well as the blood vessels. Um, and we're typically related this to a process co called atherosclerosis, which we'll kind of dive into um, in a little bit here moving forward. Um, again, cardiovascular disease is defined by the presence of stenosis, which impairs blood flow. Um, when we look at this on a cardiac catheterization, which, which we'll describe in some future slides, um, we see, let's see if I can get our little pen here. Um, what we'll observe here is laminar flow in a normal healthy um, you know, artery, um, whereas in someone with peripheral artery disease, which is a form of cardiovascular disease, we see this flow-limiting lesion um, where we see you know, area of impaired endothelial dysfunction, and then we see uh, disturbed um, blood flow distal to the uh, part of occlusion. Um, there can be major contributors to this or major causes of this. Atherosclerosis, again, we think is, is, is the primary uh, variant of this of these stenosis and narrowing of the vessels. Um, we can also have acute causes, like individuals who have a thromboembolism, so someone who has a blood clot um, that embolizes. Um, it could also be vasculitis. There could be all, all other kind of structural changes to the heart. Uh, but again, really in the context of cardiovascular disease, we're really thinking more of this uh, atherosclerosis, and we'll kind of define what that uh, means in a second. Now, we of course know some major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. We've touched on this in previous lectures. Uh, some of the more uh, or the more modifiable risk factors, which we're familiar with, of course, hypertension, probably one of the leading contributors, physical inactivity, we spent a good time talking about that, tobacco use, elevated blood sugar or diabetes or impaired fasting glucose, um, being overweight and obese, and we talked about the physiological mechanisms for that in the previous lecture, perivascular adipose tissue and how that affects, um, or even uh, visceral adipose tissue and how that affects ET1 and nitric oxide balance, as well as uh, lipids. And we'll talk a little bit about how uh, lipids and cholesterol uh, affects the vasculature. Um, and then there's non-modifiable risk factors. These are things that we can't change. So uh, we tend to see uh, a higher prevalence in men versus women. And again, um, you know, that's, if you look across age groups, that, you know, bears out a little bit differently, but generally men have a higher risk. Um, once you get past a certain age, we know that there's age-related changes to uh, vascular function. The vessels tend to get a little bit stiffer. Uh, some of that is normal age-related changes, but obviously um, you know, that sets the stage potentially for uh, worsening complications if we don't address some of these modifiable risk factors. Um, in men, it's a little bit earlier, after 40, and in women, um, after 50 or post-menopause. Um, we have race or ethnicity as a non-modifiable risk factor. Again, you can't really change that. Um, and again, uh, with African Americans um, having a higher prevalence. And then family history. So do you have poor uh, genetics um, in terms of you know, the uh, individuals related to you having a history of cardiovascular disease? Okay. So there's things that we can change and things that we, we can't change. But even within some of these non viable risk factors, um, preventing some of these <clears throat> modify or mitigating this risk can um, have significant uh, benefits downstream. Uh, so atherosclerosis, um, again, which is what we are, you know, what we're really talking about as it relates to cardiovascular disease, is, um, you know, the root word is athero and sclerosis. So sclerosis means hardening, um, and athero means paste. And we're learning that atherosclerosis is a dynamic process. It's not something that just happens um, at one point in time. It's an evolution. And we may even start seeing uh, signs of atherosclerosis early um, you know, in life. And again, it's a combination between um, you know, lipids, um, thrombosis, and then elements of the vascular wall, and most notably the endothelium, as well as immune cells, as we'll kind of dive into the pathophysiology of atherosclerosis in a bit. Um, and this is kind of what we're talking about here. So that, this is this pace. This is actually an image of 
um, an endorectomy in the carotid arteries where they an individual has a large plaque buildup and they go in and excise it from the artery. Uh, you don't see this done as often, but if an atheroma or um, a large mass of athero or paste um, is, you know, occluding flow, um, you may actually see, you know, again, um, excise and uh, surgically remove it. And this is kind of what we're talking about. This almost kind of gruel uh, looking uh, mass of, uh, you know, this almost like plaque-like uh, structure. Uh, again, so the atherosclerosis, when, we, when it develops, it's an insidious process. And it's often not detectable until individuals develop significant lesions, uh, the 0.08 flow limiting uh, reductions we talked about in that previous slide. So, um, and it might start in your second and third decade of life, which um, is pretty concerning considering how, you know, early detection for a lot of cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, um, and other factors um, are very, very um, inadequate in some areas of the country. And it's a very long incubation time. So really, again, like, you know, it's, it's this, you know, it's, it goes undetected even with um, moderate to high-grade lesions. And again, the problem is if patients don't have symptoms or they're less likely to be checked. That's why it's, it's really important that we're kind of tuning into these things and screening potentially even in P PT practice. Um, the plaques are first sparsely dis distributed, and we'll talk about kind of where they form. Uh, they most often occur on areas where there are bifurcations because there's uh, turbulence flow and the endothelium um, aren't as, you know, there, there isn't as much and their function is a little bit different in these bifurcations. So the plaque's going to be uh, developed in, in those areas. And then as you, a as you age and as, as these factors uh, continue, uh, the, the size and number of these plaques begin to develop. And again, it can affect any artery. Um, again, when you develop atherosclerosis, you don't develop it just in one vascular bed. Uh, this graph here demonstrates that, um, again, you know, you know, we, we know individuals who get vascular disease of any kind typically have it in multiple different systems. So uh, the coronary arteries, um, you know, we think, in, we think of heart disease, but quite often individuals with coronary artery disease also have peripheral arterial disease and vice versa. And again, it's not like the cerebrovascular um, sure is, isn't affected either. Again, when we develop um, atherosclerosis, it's in all of our vasculature. So individuals with who had strokes are at high risk for peripheral arterial disease as well as for heart attacks. So again, like even though you may be working with a neurological quote unquote population, you got to think, you know, cardiovascular system as well. Okay, and it's, and it's quite often you see these manifestations in in multiple areas. I believe there's actually a study which we talk about in your notes where found that um, there's a pretty considerable overlap. Actually, um, individuals with atherosclerotic disease, about 38 percent will have uh, two manifestations, you know, clinic or significant lesions, both in either cerebral vasculature um, or the peripheral vasculature or in the coronary arteries. So again, just hitting home this message. Um, so next we'll kind of get down into the um, pathobiology um, and pathophysiology of the development of atherosclerosis. Again, remembering our layers, um, our endothelium, really almost sort of like our bumper cars that help protect the tunic media um, of the cell. So our endothelium, again, our, if we're healthy, kind of keep things, keeps things in check, okay? Um, when those, when we have uh, certain risk factors, out of control, like obesity, uh, cholesterol, hypertension, the, the endothelium's um, function can be um, impaired and sets the stage for cardiovascular disease. Now, uh, the vascular biology of atherosclerosis. So um, just kind of walking you guys through this step by step. So step one, we have an accumulation of lipoprotein particles in the intima, uh, which become modified. Now, if we have high amounts of uh, LDL cholesterol, this becomes uh, problematic. LDL cholesterol can affect um, the endothelial um, function um, by releasing uh, reactive oxygen species, which can activate the endothelium. And if the endothelium become uh, modified um, you know, through oxidation and glycation, they become even more problematic, which we see uh, represented here by these uh, darker colors. Let me kind of get my little guide here. Here. Now, the oxidative stress caused by these modified uh, LDL cholesterol 
um, can induce leukocytokine elabora um, elaboration, these kind of green spheres. And the cytokines uh, then cause increased expression of adhesion molecules, so these little blue stalks uh, that we see here, okay, um, depicted here in step three. These adhesion, mo uh, adhesion molecules uh, allow the leukocytes to attach um, and call, release chemoattractive molecules that direct their migration into the intima. So you have uh, these monocytes attaching to the endothelium um, and you know, eventually um, inserting themselves into the endothelium um, and into the intima. And once those monocytes enter into the arterial wall due to these chemo um, or cytokines, or chemo-attracted cytokines, MCP1, TNF-alpha are kind of big ones. Um, they um, augment their expressions or scavenger receptors, um, which cause the uh, modified uh, modified LDLs to be uptaken uh, by the macrophages, um, creating the formation of foam cells. And these foam cells are a source of other mediators, other cytokines. Um, as well as uh, superoxide and other matrix metalloproteases, um, which affect the smooth muscle cells of the uh, tunica media. Um, and eventually you have uh, the development of these plaques and smooth muscle proliferation. So you see this kind of um, outgrowth um, from the tunica media um, you know, into the endothelium. But it all breaks down to the LDL cholesterol um, and other risk factors affecting endothelial health, um, which causes chemoattraction of uh, the monocytes. Monocytes enter into the, um, the, uh, the smooth muscle cells, enter into the entoma, engulf the oxidized um, LDLs, creating foam cells, and your foam cells proliferate and then form your plaques. And again, this process is dynamic. Um, and again, if we don't address the you know, high amounts of LDL cholesterol, if we don't address the high amounts of inflammatory um, state caused by maybe diabetes or caused by obesity or smoking or physical inactivity, um, it, you know, the, this process continues and continues until we um, develop a significant lesion. So again, um, there's three main stages of a uh, plaque formation. Uh, we have our fatty streak, um, our plaque progression, and then our plaque disruption. So again, the fatty streak just, just starts with endothelial dysfunction. And again, that can be caused by a, a numerous amount of things. Um, can be caused by LDL cholesterol, can ca be caused by obesity, can be caused by any, anything that's going to affect um, nitric oxide balance at the endothelium, causing them to become activated and prothrombotic. Um, botic, um, and reduce its its ability to you know, protect the vessel. Uh, then you have lipoprotein entry and modification, leukocyte recruitment, and then foam cell formation. If you can really remember those four sub -step, sub steps, uh, that's really the kind of the basis here for uh, cardiovascular disease. You don't have to get too deep into the weeds with uh, the pathophysiology, but you kind of need to know how this breaks down. Those those four key steps: endothelial dysfunction sets the stage for lipoprotein entry, modification, leukocyte recruitment and then foam cell formation. Uh, the next step here, we have, again, the plaque progression. So again, if we don't address these risk factors here, the fatty streak develops, um, then you have you know, migration into the smooth muscle, and then altered uh, cell matrix. And again, the, the vessel continues to grow. Um, and if the vessel continues to grow, and this um, outer layer, which will show what this kind of means here of this plaque, um, is thin enough, it may disrupt and release all those inflammatory, all those prothrombotic factors uh, leading to the form formation of a thrombus. And if that thrombus um, embolizes and goes to the brain, you can develop a stroke. Um, it goes to the heart, you can have a heart attack. It goes to the lungs and have a pulmonary embolism. And again, um, you know, really what causes a heart attack isn't, and we'll show this, isn't the full sclerosis um, or complete um, closure of the vessel due to an atheroma or a plaque, um, it's usually due to that plaque rupturing um, and then causing a thrombus, and that thrombus either occluding locally at that blood flow or embolizing um, and causing complications um, in one of the major vascular pads, the brain, the lungs, or the heart. 
So again, that fatty streak, um, again, those areas of yellow discoloration under the inner surface of the, of the artery, so under the endothelium, um, they don't, you know, they don't initially uh, protrude into the lumen, but as they develop and, you know, become a raised lesion, like we described, um, you know, later on, um, you know, like as they progress, uh, you know, they, you know, they can impair blood flow. Um, you know, again, we think that, you know, that there isn't an exact um, cause that's been identified with like 100% certainty, certainty, like which one causes which, but we're pretty certain it, it's due to endothelial dysfunction, or at least that it, it plays probably one of the more, most significant roles. And again, this is just another description of kind of what we, what we observe here in terms of the pathophysiology. Again, if the endothelium are healthy, um, a lot of this doesn't happen. And again, it's just another example of this here, where we again we have the lipoproteins um, causing damage to endothelium, the endothelium, um, or the we have the, the depositing of the uh, LDL cholesterol into the intima, uh, releasing chemotaxis, uh, uh, cytokines, which attract monocytes, monocytes engulf the modified LDL leading to, leading to the formation of foam cells. Um, and this continues to worsen uh, this cycle, okay? Um, you know, if this develops over time, um, you know, the, you can develop these, you know, fairly significant lesions, um, you know, but there are ways to adjust it by diet and exercise. And again, the fatty, the foam cells, uh, the fatty streaks can wax and wane, but if we don't address them, they become a raised lesion, we start having problems. And it's kind of what we're talking about here, right? So this is an example of a healthy endothelium, a nice lumen here. Um, where in individuals here, we've got like almost a completely occluded vessel. Um, you know, it's where our, our, our kind of random openings here. And there's another one with a significant lesion. Again, you know, over time, that cap of the atheroma of that fatty streak and pr uh, pr proliferation uh, gets more collagen and more calcium. So we can, can become fairly stable. However, um, in the early stages, especially if someone has a significantly large lesion uh, that can rupture and then again release all that kind of nasty gnarly um, you know inflammatory thrombotic factors and lead to the formation of a clot and again if it goes to the brain you have a stroke goes to the heart you have a heart attack goes to your lungs you have a PE um, so with that we'll take a uh, break here and then uh, we'll move on to the role of the endothelial cells